Great, excellent. So I'm going to spend the next 40 minutes or so sharing with you some information on a measurement construct for demand creation between sales and marketing that we call the demand waterfall. Okay? Before I get started, how many of you in marketing here are responsible either directly or indirectly for demand, some sort of demand creation within your organizations? Okay. How many of you have a shared measurement construct with sales for the health of your net new business activities? You measure together. How many of you have seen this concept called the demand waterfall before? Okay, just a couple, all right. So what I'm gonna do is share with you some perspective on how we see sales and marketing working together. I'm right in the How we see sales and marketing working together to be able to ensure that the demand that they're creating actually is, is done in a collaborative manner. So before I do that, let me tell you a little bit about Serious Decisions because as Chris said, we're pretty well established. Um, we have a number of companies in the Twin Cities that we do work with, but we are building a much bigger footprint here. So just to give you some context for what you're going to see and whether or not you actually think that anything that I say today might be credible, let me at least share a moment or two about our company with you. We were founded back in 2001. We were founded by the former head of sales and the former head of marketing from Gartner. I'm sure many of you work with Gartner. We have a very similar business model, but I often say to our clients that that's where the similarities start and end. We're actually analysts that you like to talk to, right? So very different business model in terms of how we interact with our client base. What we focus on in sales and marketing is what we call operational intelligence. A lot of times what we see in organizations is that sales and marketing make decisions based upon opinion rather than fact. They make it based on their past experience. Maybe they go down the hall and they talk to a peer. But the bottom line is, is that when somebody asks you a question about why do you spend what you spend, what return do you get for it, justify your programs for me. In many cases, organizations cannot do that when it comes to sales and marketing. Okay? So we bring that series of operational or fact-based intelligence, and I'm going to show you some examples of that today. We work with more than 800 research clients today. Okay? High tech, medical device, manufacturing, information services. The commonality between all of these customers or clients of ours is that they are B2B. Because we all know that B2B is a very, very unique animal. So everything that you see from me today are going to be best practices and data that come from companies exactly like yours. So those unique differentiators include that laser focus on the B2B universe, what we call our serious database which is our repository of spend and performance information across a broad variety of sales and marketing disciplines in the B2B space. And then last but not least is the tagline of the company is what we call where sales and marketing meet. An organization where sales and marketing are well aligned, and I'm gonna show you some of the data behind this, outperforms their peers where sales and marketing work in neutral territory with one another, or even worse, it cross purposes with one another. And in all, of, in all of our experiences, I'm sure that we have had experiences where as marketers, we have not worked very well with sales and sales has not worked very well with us. When that's the case, that makes a big, big difference in terms of the, the sustainability, the predictability, and the measurability of your top line growth. We go to business in three ways, the most important of which is advisory. So just like Gardner advises senior level technology decision makers on their IT decisions, we advise senior level B2B sales and marketing decision makers on how best to be able to make the series of decisions that they're going to make during the year, whether it is budgeting, planning, execution, measurement, or improvement. We also have two other practices, one is learning. We've built a series of e-learning courses. I don't know about you, but we have found that B2B marketers are in a series of a period of flux right now where they are being asked to do very different things than they historically have been asked to do. You start to talk about multi-touch campaigning, lead nurturing, lead scoring, pipeline acceleration. You go back 10 years, there weren't a lot of B2B marketers out there that were doing these jobs. Almost all B2B marketers are being asked to do something like this right now. So we've built a series of courses to try to upskill B2B marketers in those core areas. And then last but not least, we do some project-based consulting as well. What we want to be able to do is, as I said before, is to bring facts into your decision-making process, benchmarking data, actually bringing hard data to the table when it comes time to budget, when it comes time to plan, for you to say, this is what other companies that look like us are doing, 
this is what best-in-class companies are doing so that we can make decisions intelligently based upon fact. Analytic tools, best practices, you're going to see examples of this today. What we try to do is take what are very complex problems within B2B organizations and break them down into manageable components. Have you solve them piece by piece in order to be able to get permission to continue. And then last but not least, thought leadership. What is coming down the pike within B2B that you as businesses are going to have to adapt to? I'm not gonna walk you through this entire slide, but right now, in terms of our, our advisory, we do have nine role-based services that focus on different disciplines within the B2B sales and marketing space. Everything from the chief marketing officer, to those of you who are interested in communications, demand creation, operations, sales enablement, product marketing, and many more. Here is just the obligatory client list of the types of companies that we're working for, just to give you a feel overall. Once again, that number one commonality is B2B. Number two, about a third of our client base is sub $100 in revenue, a third, 100 million to a billion, and a third, a billion or greater. So we are working with companies of all shapes and sizes within B2B, companies that sell direct, indirect, through inside sales channels. Because all of those factors make significant differences in terms of the way that you should be spending and the way that you should be performing. And as I like to say many, in many cases when we benchmark with organizations and they tell us the other organizations that they would like to see, I strongly advise them to take a look at companies that are of like size and like go-to-market strategy that are outside of their industry because frankly, there aren't a lot of best practices potentially in the industry that they're in. So there's a lot more that goes into this than just simply saying, who, are that rote, who is that rote list of competitors that you want to look at? But rather, what are other companies that are sized and shaped like you? Are they spending better? Are they performing better? And what are they doing differently from you? So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the journey that we have taken with organizations over the last 11 years that we have been in business when it comes to demand creation and B2B. And I always say to organizations, if you want to be able to create demand effectively, if you really, really want to do this well, you've got to look at four things. Number one, you have to be systematic. You have to build an engine that is highly repeatable. And we do this all the time. In some cases, we create demand very well. In other cases, we create demand very poorly. The problem is, is that there's no predictability in our businesses. We can't tell when we're going to do well or do poorly when it comes to demand creation, and that's usually because of a lack of process. It's got to be measurable. How many of you in here that are signed up to create demand, how many of you in your organization has marketing committed to a percentage of the pipeline that it will generate annually? Okay. Out of curiosity, do you feel comfortable sharing that number? <laughs> Is there anybody that feels comfortable just to give us a range? I can give you a range in terms of what we see. The typical B2B, in a typical B2B organization, marketing will be responsible for between 18 and 33% of the net new business pipeline. In organizations that are greater than $5 billion, that starts to shrink to the low teens. When you look at an IBM or an HP or a GE, that will be in the single digits. The reason why is because as the customer, the install base grows, there are many more opportunities for sales to create original demand where marketing may be playing a different role vis-a-vis -vis the demand creation job. Okay? In a SaaS-based software company, a small, fast-growing company that's highly transactional, marketing may be responsible for 60 to 80% of net new demand creation. So it all depends on your model in terms of how you should right size. And this is big. If you're going to commit to a number as a marketer, you better know what the drivers are of the proper ranges for you. The second thing that I would say to that is this. Remember, if you go to sales and you say, I spent 100% of my budget creating 18% of your pipeline, I guarantee you'll probably be looking for another job very soon. What that means is, is that you as a marketer need to find ways to bring value to sales that are beyond the sourcing of a lead. And I think over the last five years, especially as I show you some of the things that we're going to go through today, there have been marketing leaders that have painted themselves into a corner. And they basically built the expectation with the organization that the only time that marketing brings value to the business is when it sources a lead. I'm going to talk more about this later. Just so you know, though, the math is not in your favor. And we know that from benchmarking organizations over the past 11 years. And then it's got to be aligned. 
Now, if marketing and sales are not rowing together in the same boat here, you've got big, big problems. And we see this all the time. I'm going to go back to the dark ages, what I like to call the trash dump. Okay? This is what demand creation in many organizations used to look like. And unfortunately, it is in some organizations what demand creation continues to look like today. See if you can guess which one is marketing here. Okay? They're the ones who are backing up the truck. Right? And what they're doing is they are dumping a whole lot of stuff onto the heap. Okay? And what they're calling leads. And in many cases, guys, we know that these are not leads. They're responses. And they're asking these guys, who are sales, pick through the trash dump, and hopefully you're going to find a diamond ring in the trash dump. Now, I dig around in the trash dump all the time. Personally, I've never found a diamond ring. So what that means is, is that sales is going to quickly say, you know what, there may be gold in here, but it ain't worth looking for it. And so what I'm going to do is basically ignore marketing most of, if not all, of what you give me. In a world where marketing only cares about lead quantity, sales will waste in excess in your organization of more than 90% of what marketing gives it. We've continued to benchmark and see that over and over again. And I'll tell you, the typical marketing function in B2B today spends between 30 and 50% of its budget on demand creation. So, walk into your boss tomorrow and say, I just spent 50% of my budget on demand creation and I know that 90% of that is going to be wasted by sales. Also not a very good way for career longevity to occur. Well, and of course, what do sales do? Well, they quickly drop out of the equation here. Because what they're getting from marketing is not meeting their expectations. So what I'm going to do is take you back to 2006. And what we saw within organizations is that significant amount of lead waste, what we call lead waste occurring, between misaligned marketing and sales. So we developed this schematic that we call the demand waterfall. In many organizations at that time, you had marketing purely measuring quantity. How many hand raisers did we get? We're throwing them over the wall to sales. We're hoping that that's going to impact revenue. And obviously, sales measures quality in the form of money. We knew that there were a lot of things that were going on in B2B between a hand raiser and a deal because we're talking about multi-month or multi-quarter cycles here. So what we said was, OK, and what we also saw was we finally saw marketing automation coming onto the scene. A piece of technology that gave marketers the final ability to be an arbiter of lead quality, not just lead quantity. How many of you have a map in your organization? Eloqua, Marketo, Unica, Primo. Okay, a couple. All right, for those of you who don't, it's coming. It's coming. Okay? Because what it allows you to do is use automation and scoring to actually up, increase the quality of a lead before you hand it off to a subsequent function. So we developed this schematic. Inquiry, that's a hand raiser at the time. 2006, that's how we defined it. Most of what you get as marketers are hand raisers. You don't know enough about them to know whether or not they should go over to sales. You're going to have to continually interact with those inquiries till you eventually create what we call an MQL or a marketing qualified lead. There's not just one standard definition for an MQL. There can be different definitions in different organizations. Within the same organization, there can be different definitions from BU to BU or GEO to GEO. But what this means is, is that marketing and sales have agreed on the definition of what a lead is that should be handed off from one function to the other. Okay? You're actually certifying as marketers your output. Rather than just saying, we're going to give you everything that we've got, we're actually going to increase the quality and create a standard definition around. When we do that, you as sales are going to accept those leads. You're going to formalize the process by which you take what we give you as marketers, you're going to accept and begin working that demand. This is a procedural checkpoint, nothing more. And I'm going to show you the numbers in just a second that show you why that if you do not have this procedural checkpoint, you're in big trouble. Okay? When that lead is accepted, it's not an opportunity yet. It doesn't become an opportunity until the fourth stage, what we call sales qualified lead or SQL. That has dollar value and time frame associated with it, which means if I pulled it in one of your pipeline reports, I would see it. And then last but not least, that opportunity is closed. Okay. So that was the schematic that we introduced to the marketplace now six, six and a half years ago. And what we've been doing ever since is to study organizations as we have seen literally hundreds of them 
put this schematic into place. And what we've also done is we've collected a lot of data. And one of the big things that we do, as I mentioned before, is we benchmark. So we understand this. Because everybody says to us, well, why should we spend the time aligning with marketing as sales? Why should we spend the time as marketing aligning with sales? I'm going to give you some statistics here. Okay, this is a broad pull of companies out of our database that we would consider to be average performers. They're not just in one industry. They're not just in one size of organization. So it is a broad pull. If you were to benchmark with us, we would pull you out a much smaller group of companies that, as I mentioned before, are relevant to the way that you go to market. But for these average performers, about 4.4% of their inquiries become marketing qualified leads. About 67% of their MQLs are accepted by sales. About 49% of those accepted leads get to opportunity, and about 20% of opportunities close. Okay, this is for a complex, large B2B deal. Typical uh, time frame of sales cycle is about nine, nine and a half months. Okay, so I won't have you do the math in your head, but in these organizations, if you started out with 1,000 inquiries, you would close about 2.9 deals. Okay, and as I said before, there are other factors that change these numbers, but I at least want to give you a feel for the types of data that we have. Compare that to best-in-class companies. Okay, what are that group of, once again, a broad pool of companies within our database, but we know, we see their performance, we also know what are they doing that makes them best-in-class. And you can see the changes in the numbers here. So right now, those best-in-class companies are performing at about four and a half to five times the rate of an average performer within our database. So for organizations that are selling complex, large deals that are in many cases in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, tens, hundreds, even millions of dollars, this is real money in these organizations that are able to perform vis-a-vis -vis this waterfall much, much better than average companies. And oh, by the way, there's an awful lot of companies in our database that don't even make those average numbers. Okay. And when you see these numbers, at first blush, a lot of times people will say if they've never seen these before, boy, 4.4, even 9.3%, those are horrible. 90 or 95% of what we create goes to sales, okay? But what I can almost guarantee you is the waterfall is a pay me now or pay me later mechanism, folks. If you have much, much better numbers up at the top, I can guarantee you that your acceptance rates will probably be sub 10% if you even know what they are. Your acceptance to opportunity rates in many cases will be sub 5% and you won't even know what the close is. Okay. So while it looks like or you feel better up at the top of the waterfall because you're giving sales so much volume, the impact on the business is negligible, and in many cases, it can actually be punitive on sales because you are forcing sales to cull through a whole bunch of demand that it is, does not have the time to do, is not motivated to do. Just so you know, the average salesperson in B2B today spends only 19% of their time in front of prospects and customers. Okay? That means that given that amount of time, they're probably going to trust the leads that they create over the leads that marketing creates all things being equal, especially if they, are, if they think that the quality of what you give them is dubious. So, we had this construct, okay, and we were using this construct for many years. And what we did was we watched. We watched organizations put this into place, and we learned. Okay, what was working, what wasn't working. And this past year, Chris mentioned before, we have a pretty big event now. Every May, next May will be out in San Diego, um, where we bring in B2B sales and marketing leaders for a two and a half day, what we call summit. Okay, we had about 1,100 people there this year. We'll have maybe 13 to 1,500 next year. And what we did was re-architected this waterfall and introduced it, that the re-architected waterfall to them. So I'd like to spend the rest of the time sharing with you what that re-architected waterfall looks like so that you can take what is the most up-to-date construct and hopefully bring it back to your organizations for uh, some beginning discussions, and hopefully this will help you push uh, things forward within your organization. So, evolving the waterfall. Why did we do this? Because, let me tell you, for our customers, when they found out that we were gonna do this, they panicked, a lot of them. Why are you doing this to me? I've just spent the last two years putting in what you told me to put in. Why are you doing this to me? You don't know how many people actually called me and said, can I get a preview of what you're going to present? And we gave a preview to nobody. So in the room, there were a lot of people that were sitting on pins and needles. Well, what 
hopefully that will show you today is an evolution there, not a revolution, because certainly that old model, there's nothing wrong with it. We just want to continue to evolve it. Let me talk about some of the learnings that we saw within organizations and why we chose to make some of the changes. When you see what I just showed you, when we put that model in front of some sales leaders, they looked at it and they said, you know what? There's an awful lot of demand that comes out of sales, but all I see is marketing qualified lead, what sales is going to accept from them and get to opportunity and to close. Where's the demand that comes from sales? Now that 2006 waterfall, the intent was never to not put the demand in that sales created. We just didn't call it out explicitly, but we got called on the carpet about it. So in those cases, that could have caused the discourse between marketing and sales to devolve. Teleprospecting. Okay. How many of you in your organizations have some sort of telephone qualification before you hand a lead off to sales? A okay. couple, a few. All right. We've seen a rise in lead scoring, automated lead scoring through marketing automation platforms over the past several, several years. And we have had a number of folks ask us, well, if we do a really good job with lead scoring, do I even need telequalification anymore? I think the answer to that is we believe, yes, more than ever you need telequalification, especially because of the volumes and the efficiencies, plus the other roles that teleprospecting can play in your demand creation process. And last but not least is inbound marketing. So what you saw on that past waterfall, when we went back to 06, basically everything that we were doing was pushing. We were pushing marketing at people. Now today, we actually estimate that 70, maybe 72, 73% of the demand that is created within B2B will come from inbound channels by the year 2015 to 2016. What that means is if you do not build what we call your perpetual demand creation engine or your always on demand creation engine, that you're gonna be way behind. If all you're doing is trying to get demand by pushing, pushing, pushing on your, on your buyer base, it's not going to be effective. You need to be in the places that your buyers are congregating for information. And if you're not and your competitors are, that means that they're going to have a distinct advantage because they're positioning themselves even when a salesperson isn't in front of that prospect. We know that salespeople are getting called in by buyers later and later and later into the process. Marketing, if you look at it, whether you like it or not, you guys are actually taking what used to be sales first call. Okay? And that changes the dynamic dramatically in terms of how effective you need to be as marketers. You're gonna see three major changes here, okay? In terms of what you just saw to what you're going to see. Number one is some new stages. So we've blown out that waterfall to reflect what we believe more accurately reflects the journey of demand in B2B from cold to close, as well as the different points that demand now comes into the waterfall, not just its top. We've rolled up those stages into four macro phases, and then we added color. Everybody likes color, right? So it's not that mo monochromatic, boring gray thing. Okay? You're going to see four colors. One is red. Okay? That's going to be demand that came from marketing. Number two is green, is a handoff of demand from one function to another. Those handoffs within your organization, I would argue, are as critical, if not more critical, than anything you do in demand creation. If there is not a clean handoff of demand from one function to another, you will have or be systematizing a lot of waste into the way that you create demand, and you won't know it. You'll have leads thrown on the floor, and there's no one there to pick them up. Orange are boxes and bars that signify demand that has come from a teleprospecting or telequalification phase. Uh, uh, what am I looking for here? Function, Tony? And then finally, blue are boxes and bars where that demand has come from sales. All right. So let me walk you through what the new waterfall looks like. And we start with the first phase that we call inquiry. Not a huge amount of change here, but the big change, obviously, is that we've taken that one generic inquiry box and we've now broken it into two. And what we're advising, and we're actually seeing a number of organizations do this, they are starting to track the performance of leads that come in from inbound channels versus when they go outbound. And which one do you think that they're finding is performing better? Inbound. Why? They're raising their hand, right? They have an interest. They're coming to you for information. That's a good thing, but that's also a scary thing for many organizations. Because when someone comes to you and proactively raises their hand, what is, what's their expectation? Right? That you actually have information for them that is going to continue a buying process that they've already begun. 
Their expectations are much greater than when you have a telequalifier call out to somebody that is not expecting nor desiring a call from anyone within your organization. There is no expectation there. But when I use your properties, when I come from a piece of content that you've put out in a watering hole that I go and you come onto my website and then you disappoint me, you've got a problem, a major problem. And we continue to see a lot of websites out in the marketplace that are still static information delivery mechanisms versus what we call conversion engines. Because remember, those people that come into your site inbound, you don't know who they are. You know they hit you, but in many cases you have no idea who they are. You have to entice them to identify themselves. And that means you have to give them something that is actually gonna be worthwhile for them. If you do not, they will not engage with you. They will not tell you who they are. Okay? So we have been working with organizations, a significant number of organizations, to audit their websites when it comes to demand creation. Is your website still geared for static information delivery or is it truly built as an engine of conversion? So that's where we're gonna start. The second phase is what we call marketing qualification. Okay, as we continue to drop lower and lower here in the waterfall. And this is where you're gonna see some pretty big changes. And basically what we've done is we've blown out what used to be that MQL box. The first line of defense where an inquiry is going to go and what's gonna tell the organization that it's ready to move on is not a human being, but rather a system. In a growing number of organizations right now, we only see maybe 18 to 20% penetration in B2B of marketing automation. We think that is going to rise to 50% or greater by 2018. Okay. So a sit, an organization, the first thing that it is going to do is build a lead scoring schematic or many lead scoring schematics to have a system basically tell us when is that inquiry, when is it reached a sufficient level to be delivered to the next function. And that's what we're going to call or what we're calling an AQL or an automation qualified lead. That is your first line of defense. Where do those leads go? Well, in the majority of organizations that we work with, they don't go directly to sales. They go to a pre-qual or a teleprospecting function. Okay? So the first handoff of demand within this waterfall doesn't happen between marketing and sales. It happens between marketing and teleprospecting. And what teleprospecting then does is they further qualify those leads. They call them, they engage with them, they ask them questions, maybe they try to get them to commit to an appointment, a next step is part of that qualification process. So what teleprospecting does within your organization needs to be clearly defined. How far marketing through its systems has carried the water a certain distance, it's now teleprospecting's job to carry it another distance and to further qualify it. What teleprospecting also should be doing is generating its own leads. Because okay. in a lot of organizations, we see teleprospecting is significantly overbuilt. There's too many bodies. And because there's too many bodies, what they tell marketing is, we want more, we want more, we want more. And that's exactly what marketing should not be doing. Marketing should be slowing the flow to leads to the receiving function, not increasing it. Because that basically takes your investment in marketing automation and it wastes it. Okay? So what you want teleprospecting to do is to create its own leads. Now, what does that mean? Well, it could be cold calling, okay, but that's not very scalable and nobody likes to do it. So as a best practice within organizations, we're seeing teleprospecting being used for what we call small net phishing, a collaborative effort between marketing and sales to identify very small groups of prospects that teleprospecting is going to call on using a combination of email, the telephone, content, to try to get those prospects to engage. Maybe very specific cross-sell or upsell opportunities, new markets that you want to get into, et cetera but it is much more focused than garden variety cold calling because as a cold caller, I could call into 20 different industries in one day, meaning that I cannot be competent in all those industries. With small net phishing, I can actually train my teleprospectors in a very bound, time-bounded space to be much more effective in the way that they communicate with buyers that they may get on the phone. And oh, by the way, the typical teleprospecting function will make somewhere between two and five attempts on a buyer before they disqualify them. The typical time it actually, or the number of attempts it does take to get somebody engaged with you is between nine and 12. There is a fundamental disconnect with the way that we are managing teleprospecting within our organizations that does not sync up with what reality is as well. So rather than teleprospecting sitting there and saying, we need more, we need more, we need more, that we're only gonna try two times and then DQ them, I'd rather have them having a full touch strategy and then taking their leftover time and supplementing it with some higher value. 
activity. The third phase is sales qualification. Okay? The first box that you see here is exactly what you saw before. That combination of TQL and TGL, that's the full complement of demand that teleprospecting is feeding into sales. What it qualified for marketing and what it created on its own. That's a handoff of demand that should be accepted or rejected by sales. Okay? And this process should be buttoned up by a service level agreement. Just as the handoff between marketing and tele should be buttoned up by a service level agreement. Okay? The second thing that we've done here is to add on that same line SGL or sales generated lead. Okay? So there can no longer be any debate within organizations that this is not an enterprise level waterfall. This now reflects all sources of demand that are coming into your organization. Now sales for you could be field, it could be inside, it could be your channel partners, but it is the demand that they are creating on their own in addition to the demand that they are working coming from those other two functions, marketing and teleprospecting. They're going to take those leads and they are going to further qualify them to SQL. The definition has not changed. But what you see here is actually, you now see that bar is three different colors. Because we're going to be studying with organizations the progression of demand from lead to opportunity for leads from those three sources, marketing, tele, and sales. And I'm going to talk more about that in just a moment. Take a quick interlude before I finish up here, and I'm going to share with you a best practice that we call the route around. In a lot of cases, what we have seen in organizations is when we show sales leaders this type of schematic, they say, whoa, you're going to be keeping hot, there's so, many there's so much qualification here, you're going to be keeping hot leads from my guys. Okay? This schematic, this process, is not meant to keep hot leads from your guys. It is meant to protect the leads that if I gave them to your guys, that they would have looked at and discarded, which is probably about 90% of what they would have gotten from marketing directly. Okay? But what you can do to appease that thinking is to put in what we call the route around, where essentially what you do is you agree with sales to say, if there are a certain class or quality of leads that the system can identify, we will bypass telequalification and we will deliver them right to you. Okay? They could be in target accounts that you would want to get into at a specific title level. They could be somebody who says, I want a salesperson to call me right away. Obviously, you're going to want to clean and scrub those records before you send them to sales, but we can certainly, and we do see organizations that do this. If you do do this, a couple of recommendations. Number one, do not send any more than 15% of the demand that comes out of your system to sales. Once we see it go above 15%, you typically see sales start to violate the service level agreement that should be set when they're... Uh, that should manage their working of this demand. Okay? I see organizations where it starts at 15, then it goes to 30, then it goes to 50, then it goes to 70. And what that means is, is that the whole process is breaking down. They don't trust that process and that you need to reevaluate the process that you've put into place. Okay? Measure your service level agreements. I could talk, and we did at our conference, about we, we continue to do workshops with organizations where we get sales leaders, marketing leaders, operations in the room, and we actually forge SLAs between the two functions. Because if marketing is going to create a better quality lead and sales will commit to doing nothing based upon that, then you have a demand engine that is incomplete and broken. I would argue that if marketing can up its game in terms of lead quality, that should be reciprocated by sales and taking action on those leads and action in a very disciplined manner. Because if it doesn't, marketing can't continue to improve over time, and certainly we want to impact sales. Last but not least is close. Can't really change the definition of that, that means you got money, right? So, but the one difference here, and once again I'm going to talk about this more in just a second here, is that we want to look at the opportunity to close rates of opportunities that originated in marketing versus tele versus sales. And we'll talk more about that in just a second. So as the roll-up, this is our re-architected demand waterfall. For those of you who did not see the original waterfall, this is an awful lot to take in in a very short time, because I'm asking you to take in its predecessor as well as the successor. But hopefully this will at least give you a good feel for the types of process-based demand creation that we're working on with organizations that are just like yours. When organizations put this into practice, they are the ones that are able to perform at best-in-class rates. They are also ones that when things go wrong, they now have a diagnostic to figure out why. 
Okay? The schematic's great. The data that comes out of it is great. But what's been great for our analyst team over the last several years is to understand when an organization is performing above or below the benchmark, why? What are the reasons for that? And there are typically a set of external reasons and there are a set of internal reasons to your organization. And knowing what those can be can help you diagnose problems in your demand engine much more quickly and make sure that the relationship between marketing and sales stays on a proper path rather than gets off the rails very quickly. The last thing I'm going to talk to you about is a metric, a new metric that we're starting to see organizations use and that we're strongly advising that they use. And it is a notion that comes out of the fact that when you look at the waterfall in many cases, companies will look at it as, well, if I look at my waterfall and I think based upon our conversion rates and our revenue goals, we have enough to make it, we feel good. Okay? And that certainly is an important aspect to demand creation. Do you have enough? But as you look toward the long term, what you really want to look at is not just do I have enough, but at what cost? has that demand come into my organization, right? Because as we know, it is very different in terms of cost for a marketer to create a lead, a teleprospector to create a lead, and a salesperson to create a lead. And in many cases, what happens in organizations is you get to this. And we've seen this. This has been an unfortunate outgrowth of the waterfall, but it's, it's like anything else, you learn. Over time, we've seen in certain organizations, marketing and sales fighting over who sourced the lead. Okay. Does this sound familiar to anybody? Because I've seen in organizations where at the end of the quarter, marketers will actually call salespeople and say, will you please, there are open leads, will you please credit those to my event, my campaign, my program? Okay. It's, we see it. And it's because of this. It's because we think that the notion of do we have enough is the most important question versus where did that demand come from? And I call this mutually assured dis destruction because when I sit there and I negotiate, basically, this argument between marketing and sales, we're asking the wrong question. Okay? It is the wrong question to say, well, did my leads perform better than yours? Because in no cases sh should we just say, well, just because my leads perform better than yours, that means that I win, so to speak. Let me give you a hypothetical example here to show you what I mean. I want you to consider for a moment uh, an auto manufacturer that is taking tires from three different sources. Okay? Source A, 90% of the tires that come into that auto manufacturer are without defect. They are put onto cars. Usable. Source B is 70%. And source C is 20%. Okay? If you were this auto manufacturer, what would you do? Try to use more of A, right? What would you do with C? You probably get rid of them, right? Well, let me throw two more wrinkles into this. What if the cost of supplier C's tires were one one hundredth that of supplier A's? Okay. And if you wanted supplier A to manufacture just one more tire, you had to build them another factory. Now, this is ridiculous, right? This would never happen. Ridiculous. Right? Yeah. No, this is not ridiculous, folks. This is called demand creation in B2B sales and marketing. This is what we live every single day. Because in this world, we know that in most organizations, when it comes to the discussion around who created the better lead, marketing or sales, I would be hard pressed to find many sales leaders that said marketing creates a better lead than, than my guys do. In fact, in certain organizations I have seen organizations dismantle their marketing demand creation engines okay, and take all the money and give it to sales. And invariably what they do is they come back in a year and what do they say? What do they say? Where are all my leads? Because, guess what? They're manufacturer A. Meaning that they know, or what they found is, is that sales is a zero-sum game. I'm either spending my time managing existing opportunities or I'm spending time prospecting. But I'm not 
if I take one and I flip it to the other, it's at the expense of the other job. Because in our organizations, you know, let's look at this from a time standpoint. I, if you tell me because 90% of what you give is so good, you need to do more of it, well, I spend more time on that, that means I'm spending less time managing act, active opportunities. You reduce my selling time, I manage fewer active opportunities. And if we keep our same close rate, that's less revenue. That's not a very good scenario. And believe me when I tell you, and I've seen this, it's not just small organizations. I can think of one very large technology organization that you would all know very, very well, okay, that built a demand engine out of marketing, sales wound up, or a sales uh, bent person wound up taking over a CEO and looked at marketing and dismantled it. Okay? That marketing function is being rebuilt as we speak because of this exact thing. It wasn't the, well, you know what, our leads perform better, therefore we should just do more of that. It's, this is also from a cost standpoint, this is like that factory that I just talked about. If you want to get more leads, you can't hire a portion of a salesperson. You've got to hire the whole salesperson. And what you do when you hire the whole salesperson is you incur all the cost of hiring that salesperson. The onboarding, the training, the lag time to productivity, the washout rate, which we all know exists in every organization. So even if you say that your sales group as a whole is performing top notch right now, if your solution is to go out and just hire more of them, that is not gonna be as effective as your current scenario because of all those things that we just talked about. So this is a real problem, and this is why, folks, that when you look, I mean, once again, I know if I want my salespeople to create leads, they're pretty well paid. And to have an extremely well paid resource going out there and prospecting, which is one of the least effective jobs that sales will do, is not very cost effective over time. As a sales leader, okay, the worst thing that you can say to me is, is that marketing's leads suck. I want my guys to do more. I don't want to work with marketing. Because what you just told me is, go into your CEO tomorrow and tell him that you have built a demand creation engine that is neither cost effective nor scalable. And that your business will not be able to predictably grow into the future. You should be, in my mind, assuming that you have capable marketing, working with those marketing people as closely as possible. Because they are your cheapest source of potentially high value volume of leads within your organization. It baffles me to see sales leaders who say the types of things that I just said, but I see it all the time, okay? So this metric that we're now gonna start calculating with organizations is what we call the demand balance index of the DBI. Basically what it is going to do is it is going to calculate the delta between the best performing lead source from lead to opportunity and opportunity to close against the worst performing source. And our expectation as we start to benchmark with organizations is that even though this is a hypothetical here, so do not use these numbers as gospel, that uh, my expectation is, is when you run the numbers, sales will look like the best performer and marketing will look like the worst performer. Now the question is, is how true is that? Because certainly many marketers have come back to us and said, you know what, what sales puts in it as a lead and what we give them as a lead are two different things. You're not measuring apples to apples. Sales waits to put leads into as late as humanly possible. And to what we say is, you're right, okay? And that means that's indicative of a much bigger problem in sales where salespeople may be punished for if they put leads in early because you can't get your stuff to opportunity, you can't get it to close, and that's fine. We'll start to uncover what are some very uncomfortable discussions, but that's okay. And in our hypothetical here, you take that 0.2 and you divide it by 0.03 and you get a 6.6 .6 DBI, okay? Basically what that means is the yield of the best performing source versus the worst performing source of these three is running at a 6.6 .6 clip. Okay, once again, a complete hypothetical and we are in the very early days of benchmarking this with organizations. Now, I know what you're gonna ask me. Number one, what should the proper DBI be? I don't know is the answer. I will be honest with you because once again, we wanna put this out there and see what organizations come back with. Number two, the question is, is should the DBI be one? Meaning that should you be looking for the best source and the worst source to be performing at the same rate? And we don't think that that's going to be the case. Sales generated leads should always probably will uh, perform better than that of leads that come from teleprospecting and marketing. So it's not so important to get your number to one, 
What it's important to do is, over time, is to benchmark this and start to hopefully see it shrink. Because when you see that DBI shrink, what that means is you are getting a more efficient demand creation, demand creation engine that is more cost effective and more scalable. So in terms of the process that we're going through with organizations, number one is to benchmark. And we're suggesting that you trial, trial this by a product line or a business unit to see potentially what the DBI is. For, for those of you who sit there and say, you know what, if we ran our DBI today because of the factors that we were talking about before, sales would look way, way better than we do and that scares me to death, that's okay. Because I'd rather get that onto the table to say, you know what, the DBI right now looks like it's 10, but it's 10 because sales is putting leads in, not at stage zero when it should be, but at stage five. So let's get a small group of salespeople to put their leads in as early as possible and over time see how they perform against marketing to see what the true DBI is. So that may shrink a 10, for instance, to a 6.6. .6, and that's what we call the rationalization process. Are things really as bad as they seem? Or are there some sort of institutional or systematic issues that are causing the best performing and the worst performing to look very far apart from one another? And last but not least then, after you go through that rationalization process to reset your DBI and then to go, meaning over time, if that number is truly 6.6, six, if I can get that to 5.6 or 4.6, think how much more leads now are coming from the lowest cost source, that being marketing, and how much more scalable that your engine is going to be able to be. The question of who sourced the lead and do we have enough is not enough when you want to determine whether or not you have a successful demand creation engine. It is, are we getting the most amount of leads from the source that is going to be the cheapest and most scalable? And in an automated marketing world, there's no doubt, folks, that that source, in terms of cost and scalability, is marketing. A couple of action items, and I'm happy to take some questions. Number one, okay? If you have no waterfall in your organization or no shared measurement between marketing and sales, I would strongly advise you to take the material that, that we're giving you and at least use that to start some discussions. Obviously, we're happy to get involved in any of those discussions that you might want to have. Teleprospecting, if you have it, and all that function is doing is waiting to get leads from marketing, it could be, be doing a lot more. And it doesn't have to just be cold calling. And from a sales standpoint, because we also always want to show action items in terms of an aligned organization. Sales, the biggest thing that we think that will make the DBI look egregiously bad is because of the dynamics that we see in many organizations where salespeople are punished for putting demand in early because they're viewed as, well, you can't close. Okay? If you want to enable your sales force and you're telling them to put leads in at stage four, stage five of your opportunity pipe, I would argue that every, most of the dollars that you spend on enablement are wasted because you cannot see two thirds of your pipe. You have no visibility into it because you don't know of the leads that are in stage zero, how many of them are actually in two, three, four, five. This is what I always like to call the immaculate conception of deal making. In a nine month sales cycle, you have a lead that's in stage zero, it goes to stage five and closes two weeks later. Okay. One of our customers, Polycom, did a study for their multi-month, multi-quarter products, and they found that the, uh, 48 or 49 percent of the opportunities that were put in to the system closed within the same quarter that they were entered. What that means is there is a significant sales discipline issue within that organization. And this is not marketing telling sales, hey, you need to do this so we can see what percentage of your pipe that we spent. It's if you want a more effective, efficient salesperson, why would you not have them put deals in early? So you can see how they move or don't move and then you can be prescriptive in terms of the ways that you help that salesperson be able to move those deals. If all you can see is the end of the pipe, that's the only part that you're gonna enable effectively. And I would argue by then in many cases, it's way too late to help your salespeople, okay? So with that, I'll stop. My hope is, is that this was helpful for you in terms of what we're seeing within B2B when it comes to aligned demand creation, and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Yes.
it's a, it's a very important question because of the fact that the term inside sales in many organizations is a very generic term of which there are actually several roles. The only commonality that those roles have is that they all use a telephone to do that. Okay? And one of the things is we've actually, many years ago, we took that inside sales function and we divided it up into six different sub-functions that play very different roles. Four of the six are owned by sales. Two of the six are commonly owned by marketing, what we call telemarketing. Telemarketing is responsible for three things. They're responsible for contact discovery, adding that new names to your database, Number two is account intelligence, cleaning and scrubbing the data and appending additional data to it. And the third is what we call marketing support, doing call outs if you have events or things like that, supporting marketing initiatives. That's very different from teleprospecting, which should be doing lead qualification, taking leads that come from marketing and further qualifying them. They can also be doing appointment setting on their own. They can be doing some cold calling and small neck fishing. When you see telemarketing and teleprospecting blended together, meaning as a teleprospector, I'm trying to find my own names or find information about people before I pick up the phone and dial them, that means what you have is a blended function. And what you should be paying teleprospectors for, you're typically paying them a lot more than you're paying a telemarketer or insourcing teleprospecting and outsourcing telemarketing. If those functions are blended, that means that it is going to be very difficult for your teleprospectors to hit their goals, which are typically performance-based goals of the number of qualified leads they're going to hand off to sales and whether or not that's going to wind up impacting pipe and revenue. So you really want to crystallize that role of what teleprospecting is within your organization. And if your companies use the words teleprospecting and telemarketing interchangeably, that can often be a big warning sign in terms of the inefficiency of both of those functions. Those are easy. Yep. We have a we have models that actually show. Um, one of the models I didn't show you is what we have. What we have is called the serious decisions buying cycle or buying process, which shows how B two B decision makers what stages and phases that they move through, who plays a role in those, how you message to those, etc. And then what we also have is a framework that's built onto that, which is a customer life cycle framework. So as you then get somebody, once you get revenue, yay. What happens then? Because you're gonna go through phases with your customers where hopefully by the end of that, or as that evolves, you're gonna have customers that are gonna be advocates of yours who actually go out and say, I, to the point that was made before, I got value, here's what I got, I'm willing to be a reference, those things. But before that happens, there's a significant number of things that you as an organization need to do to continue to engage those bot who are buyers and now customers to make sure that what they bought from you, they're using it, they're happy, they understand how to use it, they're seeing value in it, you're continually demonstrating that value, you don't just say, thanks very much, you're on your own. So, if you think about it, there's kind of two frameworks that snap together, before you buy, and then after you buy. And we look at both of those from an engagement model as marketing and sales, what should you be doing, what stages and phases, what assets, tactics work, et cetera.